it is my privilege to be on faculty here, and I say frequently to people, I have the best job in the world. And I mean that, and somebody asked me recently what preaching in the context of the local church uh, has done to change your perspective, and I would say amongst many responses to that question, it has only increased my awareness of the value of what we do here. Um, men who are going to be handling God's word weekly with all of the other demands of ministry need good training, and it's just a blessing to be in the pulpit on a Sunday preaching to God's people and then training men for ministry in the classroom. Um, it's, a, it's a blessed place to be at the Master's Seminary as we think about what, what we're doing and why we're doing it and what the Lord might do through us. With that said, would you turn now with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, our text this morning, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, the title of the sermon, The Problem of Pleasure, The Problem of Pleasure. I'll read the text, Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11. I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with gladness, so that you shall see good things. And behold, it too was vanity. I said of laughter, it is madness, and of gladness, what does it do? I explored with my heart how to stimulate my body with wine, while my heart was guiding me wisely, and how to seize simple-minded folly, until I could see where is this good for the sons of men, in what they do under heaven the few days of their lives. I made my works great. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made for myself gardens and parks. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made for myself pools of water from which to water a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of the sons of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes asked for, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any gladness, for my heart was glad because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus I turned to all my works which my hands had done and the labor which I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was no advantage under the sun. Let's read God's word. Blaise Pascal famously wrote, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. Locke similarly said, I lay it for a certain ground. Every intelligent being really seeks happiness which consists in the enjoyment of pleasure without any considerable mixture of uneasiness. Korolenko said, man is born for happiness as a bird is made for flight. The Declaration of Independence says, it is an inalienable right to pursue happiness. More than that, but it is self-evident. And so I don't have to work too hard this morning to convince you that you desire to be happy, or even that it is a good thing to pursue pleasure. It's not inherently wrong to chase after happiness, but the moment that we acknowledge the universal desire to be happy we come across the problem of pleasure. And very simply stated, the problem of pleasure is that we can't seem to grasp it. 
We chase after it and it eludes us. Perhaps we grab it momentarily and then it evaporates, like chasing bubbles on a summer day. Maybe you can grasp one and the second you do, you see it disappear before your eyes. And if we're really honest, it's not simply that pleasure evades us and eludes us momentarily, but often in this life we are, in fact, miserable. And Solomon would sympathize with us, the wisest man who ever lived. Given such wisdom by God in First Kings as he prayed for a listening heart, given such a, a kingdom, such grandeur, such magnificent surroundings and experiences of life. And yet here in Ecclesiastes 2, one of the most autobiographical sections of Ecclesiastes, his conclusion as he pursues pleasure is that it is vanity, striving after the wind, no advantage under the sun. Solomon himself experienced the misery of life. He sought pleasure but could not find it. One writer says pursuing pleasure is like biting our elbows. They're so close, (laughs) but I can't quite get it. So what is it that we learn from Solomon's pursuit of pleasure? As is so often the case in the book of Ecclesiastes, we draw our lessons by inference. So Solomon recounts for us his pursuit of happiness. He shows how it ended in vanity and frustration. And by inference, we learn, in so much as pursuing pleasure is good and right and honorable, the end cannot justify the means. As valid a desire it is that you have to be happy, that does not mean that you can pursue happiness by any path that you choose. And in fact, if you choose the wrong path, you will be miserable. And so what we see in the text is that Solomon pursued pleasure by way of pretense, attempting to escape the realities of life. He pursued pleasure by way of pride, and by way of unchecked passions. And as we see his pursuit end in misery, we understand that to be people who find lasting, meaningful happiness in this life, we have to be those of integrity, people of humility, and people of self-control. Integrity, humility, and self-control that only the gospel can give. The only way to find happiness east of Eden, this side of heaven, as we wait for the return of Christ, the way to find happiness in a meaningful and lasting way is to cling to Christ, to allow the Spirit to produce fruits in our life of integrity and humility and self-control. And when they are the means by which we pursue pleasure, then we will be happy. In fact, when those are the means by which we pursue pleasure, life becomes an ocean of innocent happiness. So I'm going to walk through the text and see the various ways in which Solomon pursued happiness, beginning first with pretense, his attempt to escape the reality of life. Solomon says, verse 1, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with gladness so that you shall see good things. He's testing his heart with the pursuit of pleasure. As is so often the case in Ecclesiastes, he begins a new section by giving his thesis statement. Here's what I'm all about right now, pleasure, happiness. I'm going after it with all that I've got. And then, as is so often the case, he gives us his conclusion. Where did his great pleasure experiment lead him? Behold, it too was vanity, fleeting and elusive. He couldn't get hold of it. 
Now, why was Solomon's pursuit of happiness so vain to him? Look at how he chose to go after it. I said of laughter, it's madness, and of gladness, what does it do? I explored with my heart how to stimulate my body with wine, while my heart was guiding me wisely how to see simple-minded folly until I could see where is this good for the sons of men in what they do under heaven for the few days of their lives. What is Solomon doing here? He's pursuing pleasure, happiness, seemingly through a, a choosing to be ignorant. And here's why I say that. He, he chooses wine, importantly, not a drunkard. That qualifying phrase shows he hadn't lost all control while my heart was guiding me wisely, and yet somehow he thought the wine would facilitate his happiness. And then the second half of that verse is so important. He says, how to see simple-minded folly. Pursuing pleasure through simple-minded folly. Just a few verses prior in chapter 1, Solomon says, increase in learning brings sorrow and vexation. The more you know, the unhappier you are. So it seems in response to those few verses at the end of chapter 1, now he's deliberately choosing to be naive, deliberately choosing to not know, or to say it like this, with wine and the pursuit of simple-minded folly, Solomon thinks he can obtain pleasure by shutting things out. He's pushing an awareness of this sin-cursed world out of his immediate purview. He's choosing not to see the reality of life as if somehow by being a simple-minded fool, he can be happy. Ecclesiastes is a reality check. All the way through, it wakes us up to what life is really like. It reminds us continuously about the broken nature of life. We see in Solomon's description just how foolish this idea was when he says, in order to see what good there is for the sons of men. That's a reminder of where we are. The sons of men, loaded terminology that reaches all the way back to Genesis. And in fact, as you read through Ecclesiastes, you see over and over and over again, it's full of allusions and echoes back to that first book, so much so that one scholar suggests Solomon most likely had the scroll of Genesis 4 out before him as he wrote Ecclesiastes. As he employs the sons of men language, he is reminding us that we are the offspring of Adam. We are the offspring of the first man who caused the whole cosmos to come crashing down by way of his transgression. That's who we are, and that's where we sit. We are east of Eden, and that's a fixed reality for us. We're not back in Eden. We're not in glory yet. Here we are as the sons of men, and the foolishness on Solomon's part is simply thinking that he might get pleasure by escaping the harsh realities of life. You see, as you read through Ecclesiastes, and it addresses so many different issues in life, one of the lessons it teaches us concerning the nature of wisdom is that we are to apportion everything in life its proper God-ordained value. So it never endorses an all-or-nothing theology. Ecclesiastes teaches me to value my marriage. I don't want to disvalue it because that's not honoring of God or the gift. But I don't want to value it too high. I don't want to give it a value that God himself has not ordained for it. That's idolatry. And ironically, by treasuring my marriage too highly, it becomes to me misery. All the way through, Ecclesiastes is exhorting us to attribute everything in life its God-ordained value. Allow these good things to exist in your life as good things. The problem here is not 
that we would treasure happiness too highly within God's economy, it's that we would choose to try and change the economy. We choose to try and change the framework within which we pursue happiness. We try and escape the harsh realities of life. Ecclesiastes is is exhorting us to live as sons of men east of Eden. Rightly has it been said of the wisdom literature, Job teaches us how to suffer. The Psalms teach us how to worship. Proverbs teaches us how to behave. Song of Solomon teaches us how to love. Ecclesiastes teaches us how to live as sons of men east of Eden. So if you try and tamper with the framework that confines us, that restricts us, it will only end in misery. Solomon is trying to escape by being a simple-minded fool. You can look up on the internet, escapism. It's listed as a worldview. Escapism is the tendency to seek distraction and relief from unpleasant realities, especially by seeking entertainment or engaging in fantasy. How might we try to escape the realities of life in our pursuit of pleasure, or certainly alcohol, one drink after another, thinking that that might bring us happiness because we can numb our senses to what is around us, or perhaps more likely just through the various and many screens and portals into another dimension that are available to us today, none of them really presenting reality, none of them presenting reality with any level of accuracy. There's something that we enjoy about getting lost in a movie, getting lost on social media, getting lost on the internet because it's not real. People are at a distance. They're presenting themselves in a way that is not accurate. We present ourselves in a way that is not accurate. And there we don't feel the pain of life. Life gets hard when you live up close with one another. And so we choose to escape running away from the harsh realities of life, thinking like fools that that will bring pleasure. Or maybe simply through the way in which we think about the world. In the 80s, Neil Postman wrote, amusing ourselves to death, and he said in there, two of the most concerning words used in public speech today is simply now this. A phrase he observed used commonly on the radio, used by TV news reporters. Now this, a very small, subtle signal that we can move on in our thoughts. We're never asked to think about anything for longer than about 45 seconds. Before we then hear the social cue, now this, move on in your thinking. Nothing is serious enough, weighty enough for us to ponder it, meditate upon it, and allow the ugliness of it to affect us. Because now this. Now just move on to a happier thought and escape the harsh realities of life. And it doesn't work. Untold opportunities for us to build a fairy tale reality, and yet Solomon says it doesn't work. So why doesn't it work? Why is it that escaping the effects of sin is not the God-ordained path to pleasure? Dostoevsky said, pain is the seat of all consciousness. Pain is the seat of all consciousness. Pain reminds me that I am alive. And there is a sense in which I need to learn how to cry first before I know how to laugh. Because as a fallen creature east of Eden, in some way, my happiness is informed by my awareness of suffering. In some way that I don't know that we can quite put our finger on, my happiness is informed by my awareness of suffering. So I find pleasure 
in holding my wife's hand. In part, that pleasure comes from an awareness that there may come a day when I don't get to. I find pleasure being silly with my kids. In part, that pleasure derives from an awareness of how fleeting these days are. As we understand the broken reality of life and the fleeting nature of life, it informs our pursuit of pleasure. Aldous Huxley understood this in his dystopian novel, A Brave New World, through the character Mustafa, he said, I don't want comfort. I want God, I want poetry, I want real danger, I want freedom, I want goodness, I want sin, I'm claiming the right to be unhappy, the right to grow old and ugly, the right to have cancer, the right to have too little to eat, the right to be lazy and lousy and to live in constant apprehension of what might happen tomorrow, I claim them all. If we are to pursue pleasure in a meaningful way, we have to be people of integrity. We have to be those who aren't seekingly, constantly seeking to run away from the broken realities of life. As pastors in the church, you need to embrace the fact that life is not as it was supposed to be. Get comfortable with the fact that we are east of Eden and in that reality, not some kind of fake reality that you construct for yourself. In that reality, you pursue pleasure and God grants it. And that kind of integrity that does not run away from the suffering of life is a fruit only of the gospel. To live a life of sustained integrity requires that you cling on to Christ and allow the one who did not shrink back from the cross to produce in you an integrity that acknowledges the way life is and has the skill to find pleasure within it. Solomon's not done. He goes on in his pleasure experiment, showing us now how he pursued pleasure through much pride. He says in verse 4, I made my works great. I built houses for myself, planted vineyards for myself. I made for myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made for myself pools of water from which to water a forest or of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves. I had homeborn slaves. Also, I possessed flocks, herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. I collected for myself silver, gold, the treasure of kings and provinces male and female singers, pleasures of the sons of men, many concubines. Solomon is here narrating for us in poetic fashion the building project that we read of in 1 Kings. And if you think about that narrative in 1 Kings, what we see is that he built for himself a kingdom of Edenic proportions. Lots of allusions in 1 Kings back to Genesis. He was able to execute that building project by virtue of the wisdom that he had, and he starts to make it the centerpiece of all that he is. As we see here in Ecclesiastes, his poetic commentary on the narrative that we find in 1 Kings, we start to understand the issues that were sitting underneath the surface. Now, there's a hint of them in 1 Kings itself. What you see across the chapter division is that Solomon spent so many years building the, the temple, but far, far, far more years building his own house. We miss that because our English Bibles separate the text with the chapter division, but it's a continuous flow. He spent so many years building the temple, but so many more years building his house. What were his priorities? And here, that subtle note from 1 Kings is brought into high definition as we see Solomon building for him this, this huge kingdom, and we see multiple allusions again back to the creation narrative. So it's no accident that we read that I made, just like God made, or I planted, 
Just as God planted in Genesis 2, what did he plant? A garden, so so Solomon planted a garden. In the garden, just like the creation narrative, all kinds of trees. And what did he do? He watered them as God watered them. And then they sprouted just as they did at the beginning of our Bibles. And so commentators know this high density of Genesis language here in this text, which is to suggest not only was Solomon building for himself his own version of Eden, That much is clear, and we see again that escapist tendency. But very subtly, in this version of Eden, Solomon sits at the center. In this version of Eden, Solomon positions himself as God. It's all for him. It all centers on him. He is the centerpiece. In the first King's narrative, read it again, leading up to his sin in chapter 11, there is this absence, this strange absence of Solomon acknowledging and honoring God in all that he's doing. And here in Ecclesiastes, we see his pride on full display. And so now Solomon is pursuing pride as the means to finding lasting pleasure. So how did that work out for him? Well, you be the judge. The creation needs to be populated. So Solomon buys for himself slaves. Death is now a thing because we're east of Eden, so he needs to replace the slaves as they die in his house. And sure enough, the slaves have children, generation after generation in his house of slaves. He's amassing for himself much silver and gold, so he's now coming dangerously close to violating the law of Deuteronomy 17. Don't build up these treasuries for yourself as a king. And long gone is the Edenic standard of one man and one woman as he has for himself 700 wives and 300 concubines. In brief, his attempt to recreate Eden and put himself at the center is a living nightmare. It's a disaster because his pride is driving his pursuit for pleasure. And so surely we could not be that arrogant in our desire for happiness. Don't forget that in 1931, James Adam wrote the American epic within which he coined the phrase, the American dream a dream of a land in which life should be better, richer, fuller for everyone. It is not a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of social order in which man and every woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable. Now, to be clear, there are some commendable principles in that vision not least the exhortation to a good work ethic. But over many generations, the West has so distorted that vision such that it now really is just a means by which we justify our pursuit of self-centered pleasure. We find ways to justify our pursuit of a pride-driven pleasure such that when we experience things that in life that are not comfortable for us, that we don't like, we manipulate a means of ushering them out of our Eden. What does that look like? In the church, I think it looks like people moving churches frequently because things show up that aren't easy. If it's not easy, I'll move on to maintain the status quo, to keep my Eden in place with me at the center of it. At a societal level, many manifestations of pride-driven pleasure, it wasn't that long ago that divorce was unthinkable. Divorce used to be referred to as the death of a small civilization. And now, through pursuing pleasure based on our pride, We find ourselves in a situation where acquiring a no-fault divorce is as easy as swiping right on an Amazon purchase. It looks like terminating life in the womb. 
not that long ago when it would have been abhorrent to suggest that we might take it upon ourselves to end life in the womb because it's going to make life uncomfortable for us. And today, here we are, nearly 60 million unborn children in this country alone having been aborted, nearing the population of France, all on the altar of sexual convenience. And if we're willing to tamper with the sanctity of life at one end of the spectrum, why not the other? In 1997, the Oregon Assisted Suicide Bill was passed, which means euthanasia is now possible. So when those old wrinkly people start to become a burden to you, you usher them out of the garden because it's comfortable and because my pride puts me at the center of all of it and it won't work. It doesn't work. Why is it that pleasure driven by pride ends in misery? The answer comes from understanding that all pleasure is a byproduct. All happiness is a byproduct. So you don't pursue happiness per se, you pursue a thing and that gives to you the byproduct happiness. This is the reason why if I explain why a joke is funny, it immediately stops being funny because it was the joke that made you laugh and I take your eyes off the joke to look at the laughter and it then evaporates. So pleasure is always a derivative of something. The question is, what are you gonna choose to make the something? You are inherently flawed and your life is fleeting. Ecclesiastes tells us life is a vapor. It will be over before you know it. You're fleeting and you're flawed. So to place yourself at the center and to think that your pleasure that comes from you, the byproduct of you, would be meaningful, would be lasting, would be satisfying, is folly. This is why you must not make too much of your spouse. Don't worship your children. I see so many parents worshiping their children. You place on them a burden that they were never designed to bear up under. Some of the most unhappiest marriages are those where husband and wife make too much of each other. You are not designed to be the giver of lasting, meaningful pleasure. God alone sits at the center and when all your enjoyment of life flows out of him, your enjoyment of him, now the source is one that is perfect and eternal and so the byproduct, the happiness that comes from that can truly be satisfying. And so the inference that we see from Solomon's flawed pursuit is that a proper, proper pursuit of happiness in this life requires much humility. It requires much humility. It requires the kind of humility that only the gospel can give. When you steadfastly fix your gaze on Christ and you choose to find him precious, when the gospel is the treasure of your life and you see day after day how the Son of Man descended, how he humbled himself and marched towards the cross for you, an enemy of God, how God will cultivate in your heart humility and that humility then becomes the right and proper catalyst towards pleasure. Finally, all overlapping, Solomon pursued pleasure, how? By pretense, through pride, and through unchecked passions, verses nine through 10. I became great, I increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom stood by me, all that my eyes asked for, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any Gladness, for my heart was glad because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. 
As I turned to all my works which my hands had done and the labor which I had labored to do, behold, all was vanity, striving after wind. There was no advantage under the sun. It's as if Solomon is telling us that he hit the self-destruct button. As the most privileged man in all of Israel, the king, he denied himself nothing. Anything that he wanted, he got. And you get a hint of that in the building project. I wonder if you noticed as I read it, just how it was all oriented towards him. He built for himself, for himself. He fashioned for himself. It was all about what he desired. And so he let the lust of the eyes and the lust of flesh and the boastful pride of life reign over him such that he went with unchecked passions as the means by which he would acquire lasting happiness. And what's the conclusion? Notice verse 11, he piles up the terms. The end of this was that all was vanity, a striving after the wind. There is no advantage under the sun. If you read through Ecclesiastes, these are familiar terms. Solomon uses them throughout. Here, he stacks them up. It is the most pessimistic statement in this book so far. As he says in no uncertain terms, the way in which I sought happiness was futile. So why would unchecked passions be a foolish way to seek happiness? Because God never created us to be fully autonomous. Consider the fact that even within the goodness of Eden, there was a prohibition. Even within the goodness of the garden, before sin was a thing, there was a prohibition. That should tell us something. Namely, that self-control is a God-ordained blessing and that our pursuit of pleasure through unchecked passions will only ever be disastrous. And what's so funny is that we know this principle intuitively when it comes to parenting. There are a few things that you can do to be crueler to your children than to give them everything they want. How cruel to give your child everything that he asks for. We know that. And yet, when it comes to moderation, self-control, denying ourselves in this life, we lose sight of that principle. And we think, if I can just remove all of these hindrances, if I can just get rid of the lot that God has ordained me, and drink more and more and more from the fountain of my lusts, then I'll be happy. And Solomon says, it was vanity, a striving after the wind. There was no advantage to it under the sun. And so again, by inference, we understand that the proper pursuit of pleasure, as ordained by God, is one that requires much self-control. Integrity, Humility, self-control, a self-control that only the gospel can bring. You can try. You can try apart from a steadfast enjoyment of God's grace in your life. You can try to exercise self-control and it won't work. Not for any lasting season, not in any genuine way. The manner in which we become people truly of self-control who can readily deny ourselves and in so doing find the pathway to pleasure is by clinging to Christ. And when the gospel is your portion, day after day you enjoy Christ, watch the Spirit bear fruit in your life, not least in giving you measure upon measure of self-control. Why? Because you are content in Him. And when you have self-control wonderfully, according to God's wisdom, now you find happiness. I read an account just recently of a Christian man who spoke about these very principles. He wrote at length with lots of Ecclesiastes-type theology 
what it means to find happiness, he narrates the happiest day of his life. A Christian man, he says, the happiest day of my own life occurred just two years ago. On an evening, I took my family out to dinner. We had plans to eat and then attend a choral performance by the students at the school where I teach. The restaurant was nothing particularly fancy, just a straightforward American menu. Although my seven-year-old daughter, Camilla, was unusually grateful to go out for dinner. She saw root beer on the menu. She asked if she could order one. I told her she could. She excitedly asked my wife, did you like root beer when you were a kid? Paula said she did. When the root beer arrived, Camilla poured it from the bottle into a glass. She tasted it, pronounced it good with deathless enthusiasm. And she insisted that her mother taste it. Paula tasted it, declared it very good, and then Camilla said, do you like root beer? We both like root beer. We're twins. Dad, take a picture of me and mummy next to this root beer. I obliged. I commented to my wife, I'd never seen the child happier in all her life, and for something as trivial as a soft drink. She sustained this level of joy for nearly an hour. Later, I looked at the photo I took and found it a profound icon of innocent joy. And then he says that God should allow me to take a photograph, which so perfectly represents the child's happiness. It's a gift and a burden. This picture is never far from me. I see it several times a day if I gaze at it for more than a moment. Involuntary tears fill my eyes. I want this image pressed as deeply into my consciousness as possible. I want the image to come back to me in moments of temptation. I want the goodness of the image itself to cut through the delusions of fake happiness which the devil inevitably brings. Once a man has participated in the real joy of a child, he knows why he is alive. He knows his purpose. When I give in to temptation, I reject the image of true happiness. When I sin, I wish away my daughter's happiness. I unmake it, I steal it. Fake happiness is not second best to real happiness. Fake happiness is at war with real happiness. If you don't cling to Christ meaningfully such that your life is abounding, the fruit of the Spirit, such that you're not someone who oozes self-control and humility and integrity, your life will be full of fake happinesses, and they're not second best, they're fleeting and they make you miserable, but when Christ is your joy and he makes you into a man of self-control and humility and integrity, life becomes an ocean of innocent joys as we wait for the return of Christ to be with him forever. Would you pray with me now to close? Father, we give you thanks for your word and what it teaches to us, not least about pleasure and happiness. Father, we give you thanks this morning that you desire for us to be happy. You have ordained for us joy, east of Eden, as we wait for the return of Christ. Would you give us wisdom to know how to properly pursue pleasure? Father, would you keep us back from the errors of King Solomon? May we be those who live with integrity and humility, and self-control that only the gospel can really produce in our lives, clinging to Christ, 
knowing untold joy in this life as we wait for his appearing. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.